Now, the conference theme here is uh, the BC H Historical Federation at a crossroads as it marks its centenary. This theme is both appropriate and compelling. We have here a precious opportunity for self-reflection and stock taking. It takes work, of course, but to move forward, we need to take an honest, hard look, both the association's own past and at the past of our province um, to, to present a more um, accurate and interesting, I would argue, uh, historical narrative. The, the work that we, we, we need to take up, and that, once again, it, it is hard work, um, is best described by Professor Keith Carlson uh, in, in the most powerful way. It is nothing less than the important work of truth telling for a country that is taking halting steps towards the vit vitally important goal of building reconciliation. It is to this end that I take up the history of the BC Historical Association from the years of its predecessors through its formation into its early years. I argue that the association's history can most productively be understood in the context of BC's own history of what has been called settler colonialism. Over the past two decades, historians have dug deeper and wider into the centuries long process by which certain European nations colonized large parts of the world. The concept of settler colonialism came out of this work as a way to understand those places where immigrants from Western Europe came and stayed. The indigenous peoples of these lands were in this process, dispossessed and marginalized in the new societies and polities which were established by white settlers. Within the British empire, colonies developed into white ruled nations, such as the United States, Canada, and Australia. These nations, uh, even though they shed their own colonial uh, stat status, official colonial status, status within the empire, these nations then carried on the task of colonizing their own new lands. The recent broader and keener understanding of colonialism has also demonstrated how culture has been used to promote and justify this process. Prominent amongst the, these cultural weapons has been the study, writing, communication, and institutionalization of history, what I would call the production of history. Indeed, for the settler colonies of Canada and other lands, such a history was a necessary part of the old home they left and the new home they hoped to build. For them, history, and most especially written history, was a mark of civilization. Cultures which had no written history were considered uncivilized, people without a past. These peoples, such as our own indigenous peoples, were seen to be uh, able to be pushed aside and dispossessed by those with a history. History also provided the founding myths and stories, the production of history, also provided the founding myths and stories that justified this dispossession, that supported the settler coloners, colonizers in their belief that they belong in their new lands and that the new lands belong to them. Thus, historical societies such as the BCHA work to produce and propagate these myths and narratives to the settler colonial societies in need, in need of them. As we shall see, what one historian has called the idealization of the pioneer 
has been one of the most powerful of these myths imported to these new lands. Pioneer men, and they were generally men, were the ones who carried the frontier of civilization and the flame of the British Empire forward. It was they who tamed a daunting environment and the indigenous peoples who inhabited it. A historian writing uh, more than a century ago on the eve of the founding of the BC Historical Association wrote that these pioneers were engaged in the prosaic everyday hard work of just making a living and homes in a new country. They were not always aware that what they were doing was colonizing, was building a new society. It is this pioneer history, more than any other narrative or myth, which has motivated and shaped the history produced by the BC Historical Association over its 100 year history. Now, given the profound task the BC Historical Association engaged in, the, sto the story of its beginnings is rather underwhelming. It was founded in 1922, which was half a century after BC joined Confederation. Meanwhile, historical federations have been uh, functioning in other parts of Canada for decades. And even in on the prairies in places like Manitoba, where historical societies were established in uh, 1870s. And what this was is that BC missed what uh, Carl Berger has called the golden age of local society and of the local history uh, society. And they missed it by decades. We might ask why. Part of the delay may be attributed to the early establishment of the provincial archives in 1908, which uh, diverted much of the effort of historians locally. More broadly, BC was still very much a derivative culture, derivative most particularly of British ideals. Also, you see in British Columbia, a very late uh, influx of immigrants to the province so that much of your population had a very little attachment to British Columbia, very little sense in which British Columbia was theirs and its history was theirs. And indeed, this was one of the greatest uh, challenges which historians of the times faced to give these new, uh, these new immigrants a sense of their own belonging in this new uh, society. Certain immigrants, of course, uh, not others. Thus it was that for half a century, historically minded British Columbians had to work through organizations which were not directly devoted to the production of history, thereby hampering this task of producing a clear historical uh, founding narrative. So let's go back, go back to the 1870s. Tellingly, the earliest of these string of uh, societies outside of historical society organization, the earliest of these uh, was a string of pioneer societies, which formed first in Victoria, then swept across the province. The province's first pioneer society, uh, named the British Columbia Pioneer Society, was founded in Victoria in 1871. In the years that followed, uh, pioneer societies sprang up in large cities, growing cities such as Vancouver, middle cities such as Kamloops, and even small towns such as Little Lithuania across the province. These groups encouraged the collection of 
information relating to BC's early settlement and called for the founding of libraries to preserve such material. Their stated goal was to advance the interests and perpetuate the memory of pioneers like themselves, whose sagacity, energy, and enterprise induced them to settle in the wilderness and become the founders of a new colony. And indeed, BC's pioneer societies were very clear about whom they regarded as one of them. Their constitutions limited memberships and thus identification as a pioneer to white men who had arrived in the province prior to a certain date. For the BC Pioneer Society of Victoria, that date was originally set at 1858, although it was subsequently pushed back to 1871. The mainland groups set the date later because of later immigration there. The societies that, that, that thus, they took part in this broader pioneer history that was being developed in its earlier stages by providing BC with an historical lineage. They offered a heroic founding generation whose virtues were to be held up as an example for the current generations and whose efforts were to be celebrated as laying the foundations of the province. And on a more personal level, membership in the Pioneer Society provided a sort of historical aristocracy so that a member was a privileged uh, citizen of British Columbia. With the passing of the Victorian era, pioneer era, the province's pioneer societies waned as death reduced the numbers of pioneers who could meet the society's membership criteria. By the first decade of this century, the BC Pioneer Society could no longer reach quorum. To salvage the pioneer claim, it decided to transfer its members and records to a new energetic organization called the Native Sons of British Columbia. The first chapter of the NSBC was set up in Victoria in 1898. Nanaimo and Vancouver followed uh, with as, as did New Westminster. This movement notably was not uh, limited to men as the pioneer societies had been. With the assistance of its brother organization, posts of the native daughters of British Columbia were, were formed um, through the First World War and after. The native sons and daughters soon emerged as the most energetic, broad-based historical organization in the province. And with their growing success, they made a more determined move into historical activities. The task they set for themselves was set out in their constitution. It was to perpetuate and cherish in the minds of all native sons, the memories of the pioneers, to perpetuate the names and deeds of the discoverers and pioneers of British Columbia, to establish museums for the purpose of preserving and exhibiting all manner of things pertaining to this province and its earliest earliest inhabitants. The most significant impact the Native Sons had then, and it's an impact that we still feel today, was in their uh, monumental efforts. They worked to maintain public, erect and maintain public monuments and historic buildings. The Nanaimo Bastion, the Craig Flower House and School, Fort Langley, 
and Old Hastings Mill store were all projects initiated and for decades maintained by these groups. Some of these projects, most of these projects remain today and have been taken over by um, government uh, heritage, heritage departments, national parks, of course, with Fort Langley. The significance of the Native Sons in, in, a, in a cultural sense was the fact that, that they brashly appropriated the term Native. Most directly, they defined themselves as Native uh, against a group they considered um, publicly or at least demonstrably alien and that is Asian British Columbians. And the native sons in particular, native sons of British Columbia were amongst the most active in the, the rabid anti-Asian movement after the First World War. They were propelled by this notion of, of um, rejecting any claims to citizenship and so forth of groups they called unabsorbable aliens. And they defined unabsorbable aliens as any purpose, whether any person, whether a British subject or not, who is a descendant of any of the Aboriginal races inhabiting the continents of North and South America, Africa, Asia, Australia, and the islands of the Pacific. This produced a very perverse situation because of course, indigenous British Columbians were not part of the native sons of British Columbia. By the native sons own definitions, the first peoples of British Columbia were defined as alien, unabsorbable aliens in their own country in the, the lands they had occupied for millennia. So just as the land was physically being dispossessed, so the terms and language and, and, and identities were being dispossessed, taken claimed by the native sons and others um, to be their own. They now were the the, the, the first considered themselves the right first peoples of British Columbia. Now, the native sons and daughters and pioneer societies were broad based uh, groups. Um, what you have by the end of the 19th century, it also are smaller self selected groups which gathered together uh, people from the middle, middle classes and, and professional classes. Uh, in the Natural Historical Society of British Columbia was, uh, which was centered in, in, in Victoria and founded in 1890, was one of these. And it was devoted primarily to eth what it was called ethnology, what we would call anthropology and an archeology. span they, and they had close links with the British Columbian Museum and provided a lot of the, the collections which the museum had. Also in Victoria, and this may be unknown to, even to the current uh, Victoria Historical Society members, was that for a very short period, for two years, 1900 to 1902, Victoria was home to the, the very first historical society of British Columbia that was called the Historical Society of Victoria. It was founded not to serve the interests of a British British Columbia and British imperialism, which was the strongest uh, uh, cultural ideological trend in British Columbia but to Canadian nationalism and devoted to promoting Canadian history. It foresaw 
problems the British Columbia Historical Association would have by making itself into a federation from the start. It would accept groups uh, organized in Vancouver, Kamloops, and so forth. And it also was, um, it was explicitly, it was actually uh, uh, founded very much the same constitution as the Toronto Historical Society, with the exception, it wrote, of striking of the provision excluding women. This society actually was uh, founded by pro a, a, a few prominent women. But it, alas, it died uh, when it was unable to sustain efforts. It died, and for a number of reasons. One, its emphasis on Canadian nationalism was not as popular as emphasis on British imperialism. And two, the fact that women were at the forefront of it meant that they were unable to overcome the, the, the sexist prejudice amongst historically minded British Columbians writers. Um, and men were not willing to sign up to something that had been organized by women. Over on the mainland, uh, the art uh, and historical society, uh, art, art and History and Science Association of Vancouver uh, was founded in the 1890s. Um, it too appealed to a, 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 a middle-class audience um, that was uncomfortable with the changes, industrialization, that, that were taking place and wanted to uh, instill the values of the arts, of literature, English literature, um, and history. Their efforts were kind of at that cross between literary and historical, as well as ethnological. Uh, and it did significantly, um, it, it did uh, bring in a number of of the men who would be behind the, the uh, founding of the, the the British Columbia Historical Society, both the AHSA and the Nat Natural History Society of Victoria it created a, a a historical community of people that would be tapped to when when. Uh, it came to forming the BCHA. Now, despite that, British Columbia did not get its association until 1922. Um, and it took one more piece of the puzzle. It took someone or an institution that would step forward and pull together all of these disparate groups uh, in, into a single one. And that, that institution would be the Public Archives of British Columbia. British Columbia actually got a Public Archives in 1908, um, much before other parts of Canada. Only only Ontario ha had a government-based archives at that time. Even the uh, Public Archives of Canada was not officially uh, legislatively set up until 1912. And for its first decade or so, the British, British Columbia, the Public Archives of British Columbia was quite generously funded, which is an odd situation for uh, an archives. And the uh, archivists were able to, to carry out very aggressive and ambitious collection processes. And it did produce a very, very uh, good quality uh, of the old, for instance, the old exploration texts of the published material 
that was put out as well as non-published material. Uh, amongst the non-published material, the, the archives um, held uh, Pioneer Reunion Days and Pioneer, Pioneer Commemoration Days where they collected the stories of, you know, so-called pioneer men um, that they then were able to, to put into the archives. So they too were very much under the sway of pioneer history. Um, and their first archivists, Ari Gosnell and E.O.S. Schofield, were themselves prolific authors who, um, who extolled this, who, who, who themselves wrote extensively in the, the, the mold of pioneer history. So the pieces were now in place um, and the timing was finally right for the formation of the British uh, Columbia Historical Association. Then, so in October 1922, the, um, the then provincial archivist, John Forsyth, who called uh, sent out invitations to a meeting at the archives in Victoria. He and, uh, and a, a prominent member of the Natural History Society of Victoria uh, had been lobbying historically minded people for some time to come together. And the Provincial Historical Association was founded at that meeting in October of 22. Members such as uh, Frederick Coway, uh, UBC professor Walter Sage, uh, Judge Archer Martin in Victoria were prominent amongst the early, early group, founding group. Um, and for its first few years, it was quite active and successful, uh, putting out a regularly uh, yearly produced report where uh, significant historical articles were uh, were published as well as book reviews which informed its members of the writing that was being done elsewhere uh, not about bc history not just about bc history but also canadian history throughout the association operated as an auxiliary of the provincial archives, collecting uh, much valuable primary material. For instance, through the pioneer reunions and commemorations that were regularly held. Also, the BC Historical Association meetings were, were held at the archives, and the treasurer was uh, the provincial archivist himself the person in charge of the day-to-day -day, uh, functioning of the association, its books, and so forth. And so it was a promising beginning. However, the, the association, 1926, was nearly destroyed, and certainly ripped apart, by a dispute over when to commemorate the British Columbia uh, history, not British Columbia's founding. Uh, island members argued that the the day in 1950, 1850, that Governor Blanchard first took the oath and established Vancouver Island as a royal colony was the true birth date of what became British Columbia. British Columbia members argued that it was the, the day in 1858 when James Douglas did the same for the mainland. Um, the islanders were able to pass an association resolution with island members only present that supported and proclaimed the first position. This sparked a resignation of mainland members who argued that no, this is this is this is silly. British Columbia could not have come into existence 
before the name was first used, which was in uh, November of 58. Um, even though historically, I would say the Islanders were right, that the polity that would become British Columbia was founded in 1850, the mainlanders would, would win out as we see in uh, you know, the official adoption of 1958 as the centennial of British Columbia. Now, it was a, a seemingly petty argument, of course, but it was significant because one of the things that history was, is the production of history it is supposed to provide and provide through things such as the historical society societies uh, is a founding date a date at which you, you, the historical subject came into being and it it provides that historical subject british columbia with with uh with with a, the beginning of its story of course we could say the very same thing of today where we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of the british columbia historical association and it is considered a significant thing a thing that could should, could be celebrated lasting 100 years and also a thing that caught, uh, provides an opportunity for uh, reflection. And that, of course, is the significance of such, such uh, things, founding myths and occasions to examine and instill uh, one's history. So where does all this all leave us? Now, I, I recognize that efforts have been made to put us on what I would consider the right path as we stand at these crossroads of a more inclusive and accurate history. But the hold of the old myths and stories, often invisible to us, uh, has still been strong. And I, I propose some ideas that have risen with my own work recently, which have occurred to me. And most immediately, the suggestion, the, the, the call for us to examine our own history of the association, but also of BC's history, as the process of uh, settler colonization, how this settler colonization looked on the ground its methods impact and those carrying it out. So for instance, in my work and recent work, Deadly Neighbors, which, which, uh, which focuses around the, the events uh, around the lynching of, of a Samath teenager, Louis Sam in 1884, I uncovered the, 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 the fact that the most prominent pioneers of the Sumas Prairie were complicit in this. And they were also complicit in other acts of, of coercion and so forth. They were the ones that did the heavy lifting of colonization, they and their neighbors. Um, and they were men with clay feet. One of them, uh, uh, Thomas York was an ex-convict and uh, another William Campbell was a deserter from the American army. These are facts. These are not just put out to, to uh, sully or debunk pioneer history. They are, they are a more accurate history. And they provide us with a way to see that process, to see what has until now been invisible. And at, as we go back and examine the, those times, you know, more than 100 years ago, and examine the decades since right up to our current time. It is our task 
to try to unveil those things that were invisible, that have been made invisible in the historic process. Um, and it, I, I will end just, just, just for a call that at this crossroads, if we take the road to this, uh, to this unmasking of our own historical blinders, we can provide a better history, a, f a fuller, more accurate picture, and a more productive history. One that create, uh, contributes to, re to the reconciliation amongst all British Columbians. Thank you.